So uh, again, one of those people that actually wouldn't need any introductions at all. But as a fellow Star Trek nerd, and obviously a fellow violinist of our little Neos Chamber Orchestra that is yet to be founded, but we are in the process. Uh, welcome Bernard on stage. So, um, hello fellow Neosians, and welcome to this year's Hangover talk. Um, it will be the third and final talk about the new content repository in Neos 9. And um, yeah, it will be about the content repository's PHP API. So um, yeah, that's me, I'm Bernard Schmidt. I'm not really creative when it comes to social media handles. And um, I joined the Neos core team in 2016, so quite a few years ago. And um, uh, I realized, okay, I, I, I saw that uh, that year earlier um, in this conference when it came to, oh, actually, that was when we started the content repository. So um, that's what I've been working on in the last years. So um, as I uh, really enjoy working with PHP, um, I'm particularly happy to present you uh, this and uh, take you for a walk to the lower decks of NEOS. So um, one topic we never got tired about uh, talking, you, uh, talking to you about was CQRS, right? Um, so command query responsibility segregation. Um, by now, you probably already heard of it, uh, the basics, the concept, and so on. Um, and now that we've actually done this, Let's have a look uh, at uh, what uh, an application looks like that you build with uh, this pattern. So in the old world, we had this omnipotent node model. Uh, you could get stuff like properties, for example, fair enough. You could also set stuff. You could traverse the whole tree. You could create other nodes, um, get the context for finding stuff, and so on. And um, this was split up into multiple models. For example, uh, the read model is now a really minimal node object, which has just a few identity components, something like perspective. We'll have a look at that later. And of course, properties. And if you want to do anything actively, like changing stuff, creating, modifying, varying, and so on nodes, um, then there are commands for that. So um, before we uh, take the deep dive, um, I want to uh, remind us of a few concepts that we need uh, to understand this. The first is perspective as opposed to identity. Um, this is a consequence of the fallback mechanism that has been around since we have dimensions in EOS in, I think, 1.2 or something like that. That means uh, you can have a node with a certain identity. For example, it was created in a certain language, but it can also be available in another language without actually having been translated. So um, the language the node was created in is part of its uh, identity, and the language you selected in the uh, language selector is your perspective. We will need that later on. And um, yeah, there may be these fallbacks across, even across dimensions. I mean, language is the default case that you usually use in EOS, but it's only one example of many. And um, when we do uh, these tests, for example, I mean, we have that, de uh, that default example with uh, specialization. So we have like German as the default language, and then Swiss German or Schweizerdeutsch as a specialization, which kind of makes sense to have a fallback to German. But not in this talk, because since I was born in Trier, we'll take Luxembourgish instead. <laughs> So this is our really simple variation graph, right? You'd have uh, one dimension language with uh, German as a default and Luxembourgish as a specialization with a fallback to German. Then we have, of course, the content graph. Uh, not only is this our primary projection that we use, it's also quite a nice mental model to uh, kind of keep track of what's actually going on. And uh, all Hangover talks get a lot better if you have graphs in them. <laughs> oh, let's, let's go back for a moment. So you see basically 
you have like Note A, which uh, is which originates in German, but um, is also visible in Luxembourgish, while Note B is translated to Luxembourgish. Um, there is a reference from A to B, which points to the whole aggregate, as we learned yesterday. So um, you just have to, to insert the ID at that point, and not this specific variant. And we have some child node sibling nodes. Um, so this is basically the minimal set of nodes you need to um, present all the cases. So let's, um, I mean, we do CQS. Let's start with the read side. Um, and uh, reading nodes is always about perspective, because we want to have these fallback me mechanisms in place. You have this language selector uh, in your nearest UI or in, in the front end wherever you put it, and uh, you want to have this fallback mechanism. Then um, what we also want to provide, or wanted to provide, is a repository for nodes, right? So just like your uh, usual flow repository or doctrine repository or any kind of repository you created, it's basically a thing you can query and you get a certain kind of object as an answer, and um, the content subgraph is your repository for finding nodes. Um, the API is without nodes as parameters. That means you only always need identifiers to find something. So you don't have to already have a node to find another node. Then um, it, yeah, it's a basically a replacement for parts of the content context, node data repository, and the old node model. That's basically your repository where you go to. Um, as reading nodes is um, about perspective, when you, have, uh, when you fetch your subgraph, you need uh, to define that perspective. And uh, this is defined by three components. It's the content stream ID, it's like a Git branch, and workspaces point at them. So what you actually need is a workspace name, and you can find the rest by that. Then you have to select a dimension space point. That sounds a lot more scarier than it actually is. <laughs> it's basically just a tuple of dimension values. It's like language. German or language, Luxembourgish. And it uh, replaces the dimensions array and target dimensions array and node dimension objects that you had in the old API um, to have a really, really nice and type safe um, uh, component here. And uh, last but not least, there are visibility constraints. Currently, they only support this disabled content shown or not. For example, if you're uh, in the NEOS UI, uh, NEOS backend, or you're writing an importer where you also want to modify disabled content, you should set this to true. Otherwise, in the front end, it's false because, yeah, I mean, these nodes are disabled for a reason, probably. So um, finding a subgraph is actually the only slightly difficult thing you have to do. Because, I mean, if you have like your product catalog and flow, you just inject it and you're done. And um, that's not so easy with subgraphs because there are so many of them, you have to define which one you want. So the thing to inject, as we learned yesterday already, is the content repository registry. Uh, there, all the different content repositories are registered, as it says in the name, um, that you configured in your system. So once you have the registry, there are two cases. Either you want to find a node from scratch, or a subgraph from scratch, um, then you have to select your content repository that you want to fetch the subgraph from. Um, usually it's default if you only have one, but there could be others, and you should probably know them because you defined them yourself. Um, then um, you, you get that content repository, which is kind of a facade around all these services and repositories uh, that you use um, in your code. And then you can uh, fetch the content repository's content graph, um, which is the whole thing um, with all the nodes and edges. And from that, you can get the subgraph that we want uh, to look at. And um, there you also have to define your perspective. So constream ID, which you can get from the workspace finder's workspace, and then the workspace current content stream ID. Um, you have to define your dimension space point that you want to look at and the um, visibility constraints. It gets a bit easier if you already have a node and want to stay in the same perspective. I try to avoid the word, uh, the word context um, wherever I can. 
we're so happy of being rid of that. And um, you can just call Conjure Repository Registry subgraph for node because the node contains all information that's needed um, to fetch the subgraph where it was uh, fetched from. So, uh, so the subgraph API, that's where we um, go into speaking graphish actually. So all these operations that it supports are basically um, graph operations, right? So we have, for example, a node ID um, and uh, we can just fetch the node by ID. We can find child nodes, specific child nodes, for example, the main content collection. Um, we can find uh, all descendants, the parent nodes, succeeding siblings, preceding siblings, uh, references and um, back references. That's a new feature in EOS 9. Uh, we can count most of the stuff and there's a new concept called the subtree where you can just um, find some portion of the node tree and load it in memory and have that um, hierarchical structure, for example, when you want to build a menu or something like that. Then we have two deprecated methods. They're all about node paths. Um, uh, the, the idea in the old content repository is that nodes were mostly identified by their path in the tree. That's no longer the case. We use the IDs for that. And so, yes, it's still technically possible to find a node by its path or to find a path for a node. But uh, that's actually the only operation that got slower than before because you have to traverse the whole tree and it's no longer stored in the uh, node object itself. So whenever, whenever possible, try to use identifiers instead of paths. It just will get a lot uh, faster. So um, as I said, um, you don't really need to have a node to find a node. So you just always pass some identifiers. So for example, uh, find node by ID, of course, you just pass the um, node aggregate ID. You um, can find child nodes by the parent uh, node aggregate ID. You can find the parent node by the child node aggregate ID and so on. You can have additional parameters, for example, for this find child node connected through edge name, that would be nice to also pass the edge name. For example, main for the main content collection. And uh, where it makes sense, these uh, operations or, or queries also have a, a filters object. So you can, for example, say, okay, give me all descendants of a certain type or with certain property values. Uh, we'll look into that later. So what do we get? Um, if we for call for nodes, I mean, obviously, that's the main use case, we get nodes. Uh, the new node replaces node, node interface, traversable node interface, and node data. So it gets, all gets a lot easier. Um, it's, it contains just a, a few uh, properties, actually. It's the um, content subgraph identity. That's the uh, perspective is what it was fetched from, basically. You usually don't need that, but it's just um, carried on instead of the context. Um, then you have the node aggregate ID. That's the node's identifier or the uh, node aggregates identifier. That's a uh, formerly identifier from the old node, node object. Then you have the origin dimension space point. That's, for example, the language these, uh, this node was created in and uh, contains content in. You have a classification um, that's basically used for internal stuff, but uh, it, it says something like, okay, this is a root node, a regular node, or a tethered node, which is a new term for auto-created child nodes. Then you have the node type name and the node type, that's nothing new. You have the property collection, um, that's basically the old um, array for properties, but as an object that does some lazy loading stuff and so on. You have a node name, this is now optional. In the old world, you had to, ha you had to have a node name because uh, everything was identified by path. Um, this is no longer the case, so you can omit this actually if you want. And there are quite a few of timestamps like, when was this node created? When was it published? When was it m uh, modified? And when was the last modification published? Um, then one of the new kits in town are references. So that's a new concept. 
Um, in the past, you had these reference properties, and if you called get property on that reference name, you just got the reference node, and there was no way, except with Elasticsearch, uh, to find the, uh, the referencing node. So um, this now goes by both directions with the references and back reference, and, and what you get is actually a reference object, which contains, of course, the node, then the property name, and these references can have properties themselves. So you can describe, okay, this node is related to this node in that uh, some conditions are given also. Then we have the subtrees. Um, that's basically an in-memory tree structure for building menus. That's basically the main use case for that. Um, do not confuse them with the subgraph. The subgraph is, is, is the database thingy, and the subtree is the in-memory thing, and it's just the hierarchy. You don't, uh, you don't have references there. You don't have a visibility constraints there. You just have an in-memory hierarchy of nodes. Um, which contains the level you're currently in, the current node, and children, which are also subtrees. It's quite nice to uh, render menus, for example. And one thing about all these queries is um, it's always a single SQL query to fetch all this. So even for the subtrees, uh, we use these recursive CTEs in SQL, and yeah, it's, it's quite fast. So it's, uh, uh, these subtrees also replace the idea of find child nodes, find child nodes, find child nodes, find child node. You can just say, okay, I want a certain subtree, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, here's what actually happens if you do that. So you have this find node by, node by ID, that's pretty easy, right? So you just get the node with the respective ID in either language because um, this German A node also is um, available in the Luxembourgish perspective. Find child nodes um, will return the child nodes, obviously, um, A and B for the root node R. Descendant nodes, that's also one of these, uh, these recursive thingies. It, it's just like a subtree, just without the hierarchy information, so it's just a plain list. You have the parent node that you can find, uh, the succeeding sibling, that's something new, so you can find B for A, for example, or the preceding sibling, which is A for B. You can find references, so what you find is a reference to B, you don't actually get the node itself, you get a reference containing the node. And one new um, operation is the back references, so you can find all nodes that um, reference B, for example. Then this is what these subtree structures look like. Um, they're quite similar uh, to, the, uh, to the content graph itself, but it's always uh, some, some portion of it. So um, one parameter we have um, where it makes sense, actually. Um, some of the subgraph methods can be filtered. Um, it's similar to what previously we did in memory, um, in PHP, we're using flow query. This can be now done on the database side. Um, you can add like no type constraints. Um, so for example, for fetching a subtree, or the children, or descendants, or everywhere where it makes sense. You can filter by no type. You can um, set certain property values. So, for example, give me all uh, news articles with a title this and that. It's uh, similar to the flow query builder, I guess. And um, it's, uh, you can also uh, add ordering and pagination. So, so far for the read side, I mean, the, uh, to, to recap, um, what you usually do is inject that content repository registry, and get your content repository, select your perspective, find the subgraph by that perspective parameters, and just query away. So now, um, the right side, uh, where things get a bit more interesting, at least internally, 
uh, we don't have this active record got object anymore, right? Um, in the old world, you had this node and you could say a node set property or a node create another node of certain type with certain properties. And then it just, would, uh, these new nodes or modified nodes would just uh, save or update themselves to the database. Um, that's no longer the case. Um, these properties of the node, for example, are even read only. I mean, you can still change them by reflection or object access and flow, um, but that won't do anything except probably um, confuse your presentation layer. Um, it won't uh, save to the database anymore. Also, if you create an, just a new node object, that's pretty easy and actually really neat for writing tests. Uh, you can just now uh, say new node, add a few parameters and um, test with it. Uh, but this will also never be saved to the database. So um, we write nodes in a different ki uh, type now, in a different kind. We um, send commands. And there is uh, one thing um, to keep in mind. Uh, writing nodes is, most of the time is uh, about identity, right? You want to write a node in a certain language and this language is now identity, a part of the identity of the node. Or if you want to um, change properties, you do that on an origin dimension space point. So um, you, you select the identity, you select a certain node, and change something in it. So fallbacks are, um, are not, uh, not important here. We just assume they exist uh, later on for the read side. The only thing where perspective is relevant is if you want to change some things um, that, uh, that impact the fallbacks themselves. For example, in the old world, you could like, okay, you have this node in, in German and it's also visible in Luxembourgish and now you delete it in Luxembourgish, then it's gone in your workspace until you press publish, then it's there again because the fallback is, uh, is still in place. Um, this actually works differently in the new CR because if you, if you delete a node, um, the, the, this node just in Luxembourgish, uh, it will actually remove this fallback as it, the fallback mechanism is projected to the database. So then this node is no longer available in Luxembourg. And that's where you have to target um, this Luxembourgish dimension space point where the node doesn't, um, there is no Luxembourgish version of this. So you don't target the node's identity but uh, only the perspective where you don't want it to be available anymore. Uh, we'll have a look at that uh, in detail. <laughs> yes, uh, these, um, these uh, commands are a bit more complicated than the, than the queries, but it's, it's uh, manageable. So we have this, as I already said, the, this origin dimension space point, so it's a concept of identity. Where was this node created in? In what language, for example? Um, then when we have commands, um, we just send them to the content repository. So you just create a new command, for example, create a node aggregate with node, set the parameters, say content repository, handle this, and you're done. And again, um, in, the, in the past, you first needed to fetch a node before you could create a new node. That's no longer needed because all these commands also work with identifiers. So, um, the most important commands are about nodes, obviously, and they basically cover the whole life cycle uh, which a node can have. For example, you can create a root node, that's the first thing you do, obviously. Then you can create other nodes below that, then you can uh, create variants of those nodes, translating them, for example. You can set properties, references, you can disable nodes, enable them again, remove them, move them somewhere else, change the name, change the type, or um, copy notes recursively. And that's uh, one point where I will switch over to the IDE, because um, yeah, I was basically too lazy to copy just all that code to the slides. And um, here is uh, one example of a rather simple command. Um, so you want to create a new node, and that's what you want to know, or what you need to know to do that. You need, again, this content stream ID. So basically, do you want to create it in, in, in the live workspace or in maybe you have a, a kind of review workspace where you want to import stuff before it is published? Um, then you just select a different content stream ID. 
you have to define a node aggregate ID. Um, if you're, that's uh, quite nice. If you want, for example, to import products into your catalog, you could just use the um, products uh, product ID as a node aggregate ID, and then it's easy to find them again. Or uh, if you are not inspired um, to do that and to just say, okay, I don't really care about the identifier, just call algorithms, generate your UID, and that's fine as well. Um, you have to specify the node type name, of course, the origin dimension space point. So, um, for example, if you have a language dimension, um, just uh, enter the language here. Uh, if you don't have any dimensions, you also can just create an empty origin dimension space point. And um, the parent node, that's uh, the, the parent node's ID, that's also important. There are some optional parameters. You can also state a succeeding sibling. Uh, for example, if it's added between some other nodes, you can specify where. You can um, add a node name if you want. Um, you can also already set some properties. Uh, for example, that's, that's nice for the creation dialog and the Neos UI. And you can also specify, so if this node has auto-created child nodes, you can also define the node aggregate IDs for these auto-created child nodes to make them deterministic. We use that excessively in our test cases, of course, um, but maybe if you have a use case um, where you also need that, you can use it, but it's optional. You don't have to. So, um, Let's have a look at delete. That's also rather interesting. Yeah. There are quite a few commands that you can send. So delete and remove node aggregates. So here we have. So um, so the the idea is, of course, yeah, you, you already uh, again you target some content stream where you want to do this. Um, then what node aggregate do you want to delete? Then the dimension space point, um, you want to delete it in. Yeah, for example, um, uh, for this, uh, for example, we have this German node that's visible in German and in Luxembourgish. You can now select, okay, remove it in German, then it's gone because that's its origin. Or you can say, um, remove it in Luxembourgish, then it's still available in German, but um, it's no longer available in Luxembourgish because you just deleted the fallback, basically. It's also really well documented um, in the code base and whatever this does. So um, basically, I'm just guiding you a bit through. Um, yeah. <laughs> so then there's something like a node variant selection strategy. Um, when, uh, when you had the, uh, s such a language fallback, for example, and you had a product catalog, and you said, OK, um, this, uh, there is a lot of fallbacks going on. We just import the product in one language, and then we have maybe some variants for disabling that product or changing something in a different market or so on. Then you have like two, actually no two actual nodes, but uh, 10 different perspectives to look at them. Then deleting that product was quite interesting because you had to find, okay, in which uh, languages or markets or dimension space points, do I actually have to delete this node? Um, and um, it, it took me quite a while to figure this out, and it, it wasn't really that nice. That got a bit easier because you now can just select the variants that have to be deleted. You can say, okay, only delete this variant or all specializations, or just remove the whole node aggregate. So you can just do this with, with one command. And then there is a, the, the so-called um, node aggregate ID for, for the removal attachment point. That's something for the Neos UI so that, uh, that it knows where something was deleted. Um, the CR itself doesn't really need it that much. I'm, I'm not sure if it's deprecated. Either way, it's, it's optional. You don't really need to, to set that. So. Um, that's basically the, the idea of the whole commands. They all look similar. Um, all parameters are quite well documented. Um, mostly, most parameters also um, reappear from time to time, like the content stream ID is always there. And uh, I mean, you, you operate on a node aggregate. It would be nice to add its ID as a parameter. Um, you have some kind of dimension space point, um, either origin or um, regular one for coverage. Um, uh, to, to target 
uh, the node you actually want to modify or the, the operation you want to perform. And uh, everything you put in there are um, value objects that are themselves um, well documented. They're, you can't possibly do anything wrong, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so back to here. Uh, there are a few workspace operations. Um, you don't really do that that much uh, that often. Um, this is mostly uh, done with the Neo CI, for example. But of course, you can do it um, if you don't use Neos itself, but just the CR. Create workspaces, root workspace. Uh, then you can change the base workspace. The workspace owner rename them, delete them. Then we have this publish or publish individual nodes, and the same for discard. That's what you also can do in the Neo CI in this orange button thingy in the top right corner. And you can now rebase workspaces, which means um, you, you no longer have fallbacks uh, to the live workspace as you have in the old CR. Um, so um, they can qu differ quite a lot from the li live workspace. Something could be deleted in the live workspace, and you won't uh, see that in your workspace until it's rebased, and that's basically just like git rebase, so all the uh, events and commands that are were applied in the meantime in the live workspace or in your base workspace um, will then be applied to your workspace, at least until the point it crashes. But it, um, yeah, that can actually happen, right? So you uh, modified something, um, in, uh, in some node and someone else deleted it. So, um, yeah, there's nothing to modify anymore. And then that's the time the editors should, uh, like, speak to another what's going on here. <laughs> okay, then we have some dimension adjustments that got necessary since the fallback mechanism is now a right-side problem and no longer a read-side problem. So, for example, uh, these root nodes, they are always available in all dimension space points. Um, so if you add a dimension space point by, for example, adding a new language variant or something like that, then this has to be uh, adjusted in the database as well. That's what this uh, update root node aggregate dimensions um, command is for. Yeah, then we have add dimension shine through, and I guess there will be a remove as well. For example, if you add another language with fallback to someone else, as to some other language, uh, then the, uh, these fallback edges in the graph have to be added as well. And you can, of course, move dimension space points, for example, if you rename a language or something like that. So um, besides uh, reading and writing, there are some utilities. So as I said, this uh, content repository object is basically a facade uh, for all the services included there per content uh, repository. So each content repository has its own node type manager. You can fetch arbitrary projection states. Uh, for example, if you write your own projections for this content repository, you can fetch them there. Uh, for the uh, usual projections like the content graph, workspace finder, content stream finder, um, um, there are separate methods for getting those. You can get the variation graph um, if you want to have information about this dimension space thingy. For example, what dimension space points are available. For example, if you want to build a language menu or something, um, but usually you don't get uh, in contact with that too much. And the content dimension source, if you just want to know, OK, which dimensions are there. The future. Um, I mean, um, um, I, I don't think that a content repository is ever finished. <laughs> so uh, basically, we're now at, at, at a point where we can start with the fun stuff. Um, Something I'd like to introduce is uh, additional query capabilities. There is a nice graph querying language called Cypher from Neo4j, which is a graph database, which also would make sense as a database adapter, I guess. I mean, writing a graph into a graph database could make sense. And one other thought are some kind of ACL relations where you can control um, who can access what node, for example. Um, this will have impact on future versions of the API, but uh, it's basically just adding new commands and so on. So um, that's uh, it for me. I guess there are quite a few <laughs> questions, I guess. Um, the, the most important thing that I want to um, 
um, all, or also say is uh, that, yeah, have fun using NEOS 9, try it out, do it. It's, uh, it's, I guess it, it, look, it sounds a lot scarier than it actually is. And um, yeah, I'm quite optimistic that uh, this transition phase from eight to nine will work out quite nicely. Quite nicely. So, thanks. You are right. You are right, there are a ton of questions. <laughs> um, not because you didn't explain it well, but because it's a very complex topic. Do you want to start? Should okay, start? sure. So now that back references are implemented in the CR, is it also planned to make references edi editable from both sides in the Neos UI? Um, possible, not yet. Uh, but um, yeah, there's nothing standing in the way of implementing such an editor, right? It can just be done now. So just do it. Check out your <laughs> nine zero installation and, and get started. That would be great. Yes. Can I eagerly load a set of properties when fetching nodes? Couldn't the lazy loading of properties lead to one plus n select issues? Uh, again, please. <laughs> 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 um, I, 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 so um, yes. Um, I guess if you if you do reference um, uh, a lot of um, flow entities and the likes in node properties, um, and you um, you're a bit um, yes uh, un un uncareful doing <laughs> that, it's easy. You could just um, screw up your query, I guess. But that's um, that's then part of Flow's object manager to take care of. So. Um, not our problem. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it will just work out as it worked out before, right? And uh, plus, um, what you actually um, should do is instead of referencing flow entities as a, pro as a, a property, use a reference to another node. <laughs> Staying with references to other nodes, as they are now their own thing, um, would that mean that they could be timeable and sortable and hideable and all that? Um, I think so. I, I mean, a timeable is a different thing. We want to do this timing somewhere else. So, like, we schedule a disable uh, or a dereference yeah. instead of setting a, ti a timeable on there. Um, they can be. Uh, they cannot be disabled yet, uh, but. It, uh, could make sense if the use case arrives. It's uh, totally possible. Cool. All right. The esteemed audience would also like to know whether um, find by path can be sped up by a projection. Um, we could do that, of course. Um, it would uh, like not be the funniest projection to write because paths change all the time, especially across dimensions. Did I move that? Uh, did I mention that move node was my like final boss when implementing this? <laughs> Um, so, um, and uh, yeah, we could do that if paths um, become a thing again. But uh, to be honest, we, I think we almost managed to completely erase them from the NEOS code base. They're uh, massively overrated. <laughs> it's true. Um, so, when the editor deletes the Luxembourg node, that was, uh, that was from your example uh, when you showed... Um, that the fallback is mm -hmm. removed. So, um, is this case possible via the back end, and how can this normal fallback restored again? Uh, yes, uh, that's in, uh, in preparation. Um, this restoration, it's, uh, it's a new command. Um, I'm not sure if uh, the UI has the capabilities yet, but the restoration, um, it's always uh, already done for Postgres. I just have to migrate it back to MySQL, and then it, I think it will be in 9.0. Um, then uh, this restoration is, of course, not available in the Neos UI yet. Um, no, because we, didn't, uh, we couldn't do it before. Uh, so. Yeah, it, it, it was a no, pro no problem before. So um, yeah, that's something that could be added quite easily, actually. All right. Is the new CR creating a node copy for each workspace or only for changed nodes as in NEOS 8? If all nodes are created, is there an automatic re rebase mechanism? Um, we, uh, we don't copy nodes until necessary. So this is basically copy on write, what we implemented. And instead of copying all nodes, we only copy all uh, edges 
on hierarchy engines. That's what's happening internally. And um, rebasing, I'm not sure when it when it happens or if it's uh, maybe it's it's you can add it as a cron job. I think it always happens if you re-lock in into the nearest backend, but uh, I'm not not 100% sure right now. But um, yeah, you could do this um, yourself in, in, in question. When in question. Cool. Last one. So are changes already being refactored by Rector? So the changes that need to be made to your code base when you update, I guess. Is the idea? Um, that, that's uh, I think that's what uh, what Sebastian talked about in his talk. Um, so yes, uh, there are rector rules for um, adjusting your code base um, in Fusion, YAML, and PHP. Um, they're probably not complete yet because um, we only did this on Docs and Neos IO. Um, so that's another point for uh, updating early. We are really happy if you run into issues so we can fix them before the release. Cool. That's thank it. Thank you so much, Bernard. Yeah, thank you. Don't forget to rate the talk. <laughs> <laughs>